you know, I can be in any situation and I'll think even like I could be in a fight with my wife and, and, and we're having our fight and it's serious or whatever, but in the back of my head, I'm thinking like, what could I say now that would give like the maximum comedic like uh, result or the maximum dramatic? And I can't do that, of course, because I love my wife and I want to stay married to her. But uh, in the back of my head, you know, when I'm in almost any situation, I'm always thinking of, of those possibilities and how they can affect like how people's lives go. Uh, and I think in a way this might be more applicable to, uh, to I guess, like the fandom subculture, uh, how, how much we kind of process our own lives through these uh, entertainment experiences and how that can affect the sense of ownership and belonging um, yeah, sure. to those and, and give them a certain sort of intensity. Um, when I grew up, I was uh, pretty poor. Yeah. Boo-hoo. So, um, so drawing was cheap. You could just pick a piece of paper and draw. Um, that was great. And uh, I think even then I was kind of a jerk where I'd be like, uh, I didn't like that way that story went. It should have been like this instead. And then I could just draw it myself. Um, but, uh, and that was true more even specifically of comics because uh, first of all with comics, um, one of the great things was, you know, again, it was cheap, uh, a bunch of comics and I think a big league chew. And that was like Saturday right there. Um, <laughs> So that, that was awesome. Um, Did you have to fight a bear on your way to school too? Uh, no, unfortunately, there were no, there were no bears. It was Texas, so there were just like rattlesnakes and armadillos. I didn't and, know you were from Texas. And, and racist and shit. Yeah. Um, but uh, sometimes racist rattlesnakes. <laughs> they're, well, they're more like ableist than anything, but yeah. Um, but one of the great things about comics then was also that uh, there was no filter. Like again. Um, with, you know, if there's a movie, then someone has to script it and, you know, there's a whole production team, all this stuff. And, and there was a lot of money involved, so people pay attention. But with comics, and I mentioned this in an earlier panel, like I remember seeing X-Men when uh, the White Queen first showed up. And she's this lady, she's got a riding crop, a giant fur cape, a choker, like a white latex uh, lace-up bustier and bikini and thigh-high stilettos. And um, as a kid, I'm sure I was also like, ooh, boobies. But, uh, but I was also like, wow, someone wrote this, someone drew this, and now it's in my hand, and obviously no one else at any point was paying attention. Right. So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I just thought that, you know, that was amazing. There was this, this crazy, uh, I don't want to say like punk rock, but there was definitely this sense of if you can think it up, then you can put it in a comic, and, you know, no one's going to stop you. So, so I think that was something that really just always appealed to me in, in comics in general. And, you know, also there was fact, and this probably seems less resonant now, but back then, like if you saw Star Wars or something and you loved it, you're like, oh, that's awesome. Then, you know, congratulations. You're never going to see another fucking movie like that for uh, like five years. But now, you know, nowadays that doesn't seem quite so obvious because you can stream stuff or you can rewatch anything. You know, then if you missed a TV show, yeah. um, too bad. You know, when the movie was out of theater, too bad. Yeah. Uh, whereas a comic every month, hey, there's another uh, space adventure. So transitioning that, though, from the point that you fell in love with it to the point that you were like, all right, I'm pursuing this, you know, for, for a career, for a art form, for a life style. Sure. Well, I had this problem, which I still kind of have, but um, I'm terrible when it comes to business or career where I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to be a comic book artist ever since I was a little kid. Um, and I worked really hard on the being good at the drawing part, mm -hmm. but I never stopped to think like, oh, I should probably show this to someone or you know, put together a sample. Like I'd kind of have to do that every once in a while and then I, like a butterfly would go by me and I'd get distracted. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually, I ended up in children's books for a while um, and then like actually at the children's book publishing company and then I went over. Which is really funny because you're a comic book artist and when you're a comic book artist everyone always asks you to draw a children's book. Except for actual children's book people. Yeah, exactly. Because they're, like, they're like comics are for like, every you know, <coughs> troglodytes. Yeah. I yeah. got a dog named Popcorn that I okay. want to write a book about. Yeah. He's yeah. got a little wheelbarrow that's got his own. Got <laughs> I did children's books too. Yeah, I, yeah, I got a lot of... Screaming and, and I used to describe it as... Because uh, when people go, what's it like working in children's books? And I'd say, it's like doing hard time at the petting zoo. <laughs> it kind of, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And then, uh, but yeah, so I, uh, I really liked the, uh, uh, children's books, but I wasn't really good at, the, uh, at my job. And then uh, I ended up as a toy designer and this whole time, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm totally going to get into uh, comics eventually. And the toy, I was actually at Marvel uh, in their toy division, and was I had it, an idea for it. Was it hard to break into the toy design? It was insanely easy. 
because I was trying to get a job doing toy packaging. And so I called the art department and they're like, oh no, we have our own incredibly corrupt way of doing that. You're never going to get a job with that. Um, <laughs> I wish it was that matter of fact. It, it, yeah, I mean, that's basically what they said. Uh, they said, but we need a toy designer in our division, our toy design division, can you do d design toys? And of course, as you all know, if you're ever in a situation like that, the answer is always yes. Of course. Of course I can. Yeah, absolutely. So then I, I went to Toys R Us and saw some Toy Biz toys. I was like, yeah, I can do that. Because um, they, 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 they were definitely a, uh, a make things quickly and move those units kind of company at that time. Uh -huh. uh, so I interviewed there. I wasn't qualified at all. But then it turned out that no actually qualified designer would take the job for the money they were offering. Yeah. But it was cool because they, like, they had no money for anything. So they'd be like, so you know, we'd say like, oh, we want to do an entire toy line that's just like Iceman. Like there could be Red Iceman, Blue Iceman, maybe Iceman on a sword. And they'd be like, all right, fine. Because they'd be like, all right, we only have to make one Iceman tool. So <laughs> Yellow just, Iceman. He's it, made it changed the color, yeah. So, <laughs> so they were totally, uh, you know, so they were into cheap, like not paying attention stuff. So they hired me. Um, and actually, it was cool because in my spare time, I would just draw like cartoony, my cartoony crap, like Harry Potter and my own stories and stuff. And one day, one of the executives was going to my, my office, uh, office, my desk with a wall behind it. And he saw some of my drawings and I said, I like that kid. Put him on this new project. And it was, uh, they were trying to get a Harry Potter license. And this was before Harry Potter was Harry Potter. It was just a bunch of books. And all the designers in my department were really, really, really good. But they also spent all their time doing superheroes and wrestlers. So like Harry Potter looked like he could, you know, like throw a truck. And I think Voldemort might have been drawn like a cyborg. I don't know. Um, and my stuff had that cartoony. <laughs> It was, yeah, I know, it was, I mean, it looked cool to me. I want to read that. <laughs> uh, Monster Truck Harry Potter. That's right. Well, I mean, DC owns the rights, so. Uh, but yeah, no, so actually I had an idea for, it was a good idea too, those motherfuckers. So uh, I want to do an all fantasy X-Men line of toys. Wow. Good one. See? Yeah, yeah. And I also want to do a Shield versus Hydra line, but it'd be like all young and cool and then like crazy transforming like battles, you know, like just like 80s, whatever stuff. Um, and my company's like, huh, that would cost money. Go to hell. So, um, I, and I was at, I was, you know, we were in the Marvel building. We're part of Marvel. So I went to one of the Marvel editors I knew and said, I want to do a comic. He's like, eh, I said, it's Fantasy X-Men. He said, yes! So he had no, you know, I didn't have any background or anything, but uh, he had me do all the characters, everything for it. It was really cool. I, went, I did a lot of stuff for it. I went to his office one day. It was, he was gone. Like hard gone. Like the chair was still spinning. There were like wires dangling from the roof. <laughs> Um, so I went up to a couple other people at Marvel and said, oh, I was kind of doing this thing with this guy, blah, blah, blah. And they all said, go away. You're not allowed in here. I was like, no, I work here. They're like, no, go away. So I was like, the hell with that. I'm going to do comics my own way. So then I, uh, went to Dallas barbecue, which is a, uh, yes. a New York tradition, of course. And, um, I don't know, had like a 15 gallon margarita or something and said, I'm going to show them, I'm going to go to a comic convention and actually get a job, which, you know, would have been a really good idea 15 years before. Because uh, at that point, I was like 29 or 30, and I'd been kind of lax, but I did it, and I showed my stuff to like 20 people, and 18 of them said, this stuff sucks. Because um, it was cartoony, and this was 2001 or 2002, and that was still considered like not a compliment to be cartoony. But uh, someone from Dark Horse said, I like this, and wanted to do... Uh, creator own comic with me and pay me money, which was back then pretty That's crazy. Pretty crazy thing that was. Gate, it was the. I'm gonna. Say, I'm gonna be honest with you. It ended up being the worst experience of my life. But at the time, I was like, Oh my God, it's Dark Horse. Yeah, I mean, talk about yeah. validation. I know Hellboy. It's gonna be in color. It's gonna be real pages. So I was super excited. And then DC, a guy from DC, Richard Bruning, was like, Dude, I love your art. We can't hire you though because it's cartoony. But then he found all sorts of crazy random. My first job for DC was I took three weeks and I just redesigned the entire DC. Kind of basically what I'm doing right now. That was because because you know when you make comics, no one reads comics realistically. Um, no one even watches the cartoons. What they do is they spend all their money on the lunch boxes and, and the kites and the sleeping bags. And so this one and so Richard Bruning had this brilliant idea. He's like, why spend all that money making a goddamn cartoon? That you know that's going to cost money and take time and then license it. Why don't we just make all the licensing stuff first? So he had me basically do this for three weeks. I paid like, I don't know, like $2,000 or something. It was awesome. I mean, the one bad side effect is ever since then, every time I've been hired to do any comic book, I will promptly sit down and redesign all the characters because I was taught that's what is acceptable to do. And oops. Um, and yeah, actually, most people are not cool with that. Most people uh, say, no, you have to stay on model. I mean, I don't listen. 
I think it, it, you guys could probably swap. We haven't seen Mike draw yet. Yeah. Wait, am I gonna yeah, drop go this ahead. thing out? No, yeah, Can you sure. pick that up? Yeah, Cause yeah. I got a pile of stuff. What about you, Mike? You've kind of come in and out of comics. You have carved a really unique. Yeah, it's because uh, <coughs> I keep my foot in just like all of the streams. So I and I don't. I have such a short attention span that I get bored of one thing or and go to the other. So I do illustration work and I do comics and uh, I draw. And when I draw comics, I draw superhero comics and I also draw write and draw my own indie type of stories. Yeah. So. I like to do it all, you know. Did you break into like illustration professionally first? No, you know what happened was uh, I went to art college and I was a conceptual artist. So I did installation work and like uh, uh, like I would uh, like I would like smash things and put it in a pile on the middle of the floor and, uh -huh. and then yeah. and have a gallery show like that. And then I realized that I doing that, that I'm not making any money. So I'm like, okay, I, now that I'm out of the safety net of art college, I actually have to make a living. And uh, what happened was uh, I had a friend who was a film director and uh, he hired me to do storyboards because I could draw. Uh -huh. and, then, uh, and then he did a children's, uh, he did a book actually, uh, of, uh, like an autobiography and he asked me to do some drawings for it. And uh, I, after that, I was painting like murals on the side of buildings, just anything to stay in art as a 20 year old, you know, graduate. And, uh, sure. and you know, I silk screen t shirts, whatever. I just viewed it as like, you should just do, try everything, and then you can whittle down later. But so you're taking a leap from being a guy who does really abstract, thought centered, centric art. Yeah. Right, where you're basically asking someone to engage with something and come up with their own conclusion. Right. To then working in a medium where, A, there's an emphasis on anything in comics that is a deconstruction is a oh. deconstruction of clarity almost. Yes. Right? So clarity is the norm. Yes. So you're basically completely... You know, shifting functions. Yeah, but uh, that's still going back to uh, essential art school training. Like, I know friends of mine who um, uh, went to illustration programs and they took animation. And, and when I tell them this is what I took in art college, they're like, what? How did you end up here? And to be honest, uh, I always found that the training I got uh, as uh, an artist working in contemporary art was, uh, God, that sounds so snotty, right? <laughs> Sorry, artist working in contemporary art. what it was, art. man. <coughs> and uh, the training I got, uh, I use daily, and it's it's what comes down to this. It's um, I know some friends they get an assignment, and then uh, let's say I don't know you have to draw Spider-Man for a cover, yeah. right? And they're going, okay, I'm, how do I make this cool? And uh, how do I render the webs? How do I do the the buildings in perspective? What's the uh, the proper angle for this type of thing? What's uh, you yeah, know the what's the narrative of this thing? Surface down, right? And and what's the am I going to render this digitally? Am I going to paint it? And my first impulse is, what's the point of this? What's yeah, the meaning yeah. behind this thing, you know? And I'm always trying to strip it back down to that, right? right? So that's what, like, uh, so I use, okay, what, is, what makes this, what makes Spider-Man work, you know? And, uh, and how can I strip away everything else and get down to that essence and build from that? That's right? weirdly similar to designing toys. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Philosophically, right? Like, yeah, people have to hold this and play with it. What are they gonna wanna do with it? And I think it's also like part of my nature. Like, for example, uh, when it comes to music, the yeah. thing I like most is uh, is the raw stuff. Like uh, I like the four track demo. Uh, God, that sounds like such a hipster thing. <laughs> uh, I like the four track demo rather than the produced thing. Yeah. I like you the know? three track demo. It's yeah. actually much more stripped down. I was into three track demos before they were three track right. demos. Okay, <laughs> so but like I, I prefer that. I like the live recording. I like yeah, yeah. the uh, the thing that's written at the moment of the, like when the songwriters come up with it and is recording it in their in their like. A kitchen yeah. and w with a little recorder and the dog barking in the background. I like that version of the song better than the one that's in the studio that's got a lot of production. So, and I find that like same thing with movies. I just like it raw, yeah, you know. Sure. Yeah. So I, I prefer the version that's stripped. Yeah, down. I'm always trying to get what's underneath to yeah. communicate on top. Yeah, and it's you know? like um, I could spend all day adding more more to it, or I can or I can draw less and think more. And I'd rather do that approach just for me. That's just a personal take. So I once was asked like a, by a friend, uh, if you can draw it like, cause there was a friend of mine who was really talented and he could draw in a lot of different styles. And he was like, if you, can, if you know how to draw in a lot of different styles, what style do you pick? Right, and, and it's like, yeah, it varies on the project, sure. But also at that point, if all the approaches are equal, right? 
you go with what your philosophy is. Yes. Right? Mm. And for me, it's just, yeah, reduce. Yeah. If I get two versions of something that's equal, and I sit there and go, well, which one is raw? You know, and that's the one I prefer, if they both look good.